Hi, my name is Anna Claire Wright, and in this video, I will be talking about Spanish-influenced English. More specifically, I will present about the demographic information pertaining to those who speak Spanish-influenced English in the United States, and about common speech and language errors made by those who speak Spanish-influenced English. First, we must establish what Spanish-influenced English is. According to the American Speech and Hearing Association, Spanish-influenced English is the influence of the linguistic features of the Spanish language on the acquisition and or production of the English language. This includes the major language components of semantics and syntax, which also includes grammatical elements like prepositions and verbs, which we will address more in depth later. Phonology is another major language component that is heavily affected in Spanish-influenced English. Because each language has its own unique phonemic system, for individuals learning English as a second language, it is common for the phonemic system of their first language to influence the production of sounds in English, their second language. Now that we've established what Spanish-influenced English is and have identified the major language components that are affected by it, it is important that we now identify who the population of Spanish-influenced English speakers is in the United States. So, who might speak Spanish-influenced English? Well, there are two main terms used to describe Spanish-speaking individuals who learn English. Those who learn English as a second language, or ESL, and English language learners, or ELLs. The main technical difference between these two terms is that ESL speakers learn English as their second language specifically, while for English language learners, English does not necessarily have to be their second language learned, it could be their third or fourth, for example. However, there are more qualities that pertain to each of these terms that differentiate them. To start, ESL is a traditional term used to refer to the study of the English language by non-native speakers, which takes place in an established English-speaking country. Also, ESL students are pulled out of the general education classroom to be taught by ESL teachers who need specific certifications and training in teaching English as a second language. English language learner is a universally accepted term that is commonly used in K-12 settings to refer to a student who is not currently proficient as an English speaker and who is in the process of developing his or her English language skills. ELL refers to any student who is struggling to learn English, but as I said earlier, English does not have to be their second language learned. ELL is interchangeable with the term Limited English Proficient, or LEP, which refers to any student who is not able to speak proficiently in English. Finally, in contrast to ESL students who are taught by special ESL teachers, ELL students are part of the general education classroom. Speakers of Spanish-influenced English do not necessarily have to be ELLs or ESL speakers, however. In other words, the individual does not have to be someone whose primary language is Spanish and who learns English as a foreign language. In fact, a speaker of Spanish-influenced English may be someone who doesn't know any Spanish at all. You see, a Spanish-influenced English speaker may be someone whose primary language is English, but who grew up in a household where his or her family members or caregivers spoke Spanish-influenced English. Despite the individual not knowing or speaking any Spanish, or, more likely, being able to read or speak very little Spanish, as a national survey performed in 2006 found that fewer than 5% of U.S. Latinos say that they can neither read nor converse even a little in Spanish, this individual's language acquisition will be affected by another speaker's Spanish-influenced English. So, who are Spanish speakers in the United States? Mexicans make up the majority of the Hispanic population in the U.S. As of 2015, seven people groups of Hispanic origin had populations of over 1 million in the U.S., with Mexicans at 35 million, making up 63.3% of the U.S. Hispanic population, then Puerto Ricans at 5 million, which includes Puerto Ricans on the island of Puerto Rico as well as those who live on the continental U.S., who make up 9.5% of the Hispanic population, and then Salvadorans, Cubans, Dominicans, Guatemalans, and Colombians. It is also important to note that the most dominant Spanish dialects spoken in the U.S. are, understandably, Mexican Spanish, Puerto Rican Spanish, Cuban Spanish, and Peninsular Spanish, which is also known as the Spanish of Spain, or European Spanish. Now, why is it important to learn about Spanish-influenced English? Well, Hispanics are the largest minority group in the United States, with African Americans being the second largest and Asians being the third. Also, as of 2019, across the U.S., ELLs made up at least 20% of SLP's caseloads, and in states along the coasts and in the southern United States, which includes Kentucky, that percentage is much higher. In fact, as of 2019, ELLs made up 29-39% to of SLP's caseloads in Kentucky, and naturally, because Hispanics are the largest minority group in the U.S., Spanish-speaking individuals make up the majority of ELLs that SLP's in Kentucky serve. 
Actually, if we look at this chart of the top three languages spoken in each U.S. state by limited English proficient students, which you may remember is just another term for English language learners, we can see Spanish is the first language spoken by ELLs in every U.S. state with the exception of Alaska, Hawaii, Maine, and Vermont. Another important reason for which it is important to learn about Spanish influenced English is because Hispanics are among the fastest growing groups in the U.S. According to the U.S. Census Bureau, between the years 2014 and 2060, the Hispanic population is projected to be among the fastest growing groups in the United States, increasing from 55 million in 2014, accounting for 17% of the U.S. population, to 119 million in 2060, accounting for 29% of the U.S. population, which is more than one quarter of the total population. This is an increase of 115%. Because the Hispanic population is such a dominant one in the United States today and will only continue to grow larger in the future, and because we know that Spanish-speaking ELLs make up the majority of ELLs that SLPs have on their caseloads, it is imperative that SLPs are able to distinguish between the Spanish-speaking clients who are simply making errors that are due to the influence of the Spanish language on the English language, or that are normal developmental errors, and the clients who are making atypical errors that are due to a speech or language impairment. In other words, we must be able to distinguish between a language difference and a language disorder. I will now focus on the speech and language errors common to Spanish-influenced English speakers. As the number of Hispanics in the U.S. grows, it would benefit us to have a basic understanding of typical patterns of second language acquisition and errors. This will help us to better understand which patterns in bilingual development are typical, even in terms of errors, versus those that might indicate a language impairment, and will help us to better create goals and objectives for bilingual clients based on their language disorder rather than creating those that are geared toward correcting second language patterns. The five main areas where Spanish-influenced English speakers may make typical second language errors, which remember would be indicative of a language difference and not a language disorder as they would fall under the category of errors due to second language influence, are prepositions, multipurpose verbs, grammar and syntax, vocabulary and semantics, and phonology. We'll start with prepositions. Let's first establish why a Spanish speaker acquiring English might use an incorrect preposition, and then we will look at some examples of commonly misused prepositions in Spanish-influenced English. The use of prepositions is a common area of perceived errors for Spanish speakers learning English because one Spanish preposition might correspond to two English prepositions. Thus, a Spanish, spe Spanish speaker acquiring English might mix up the use of the corresponding English prepositions. Additionally, concepts represented by prepositions in English often get translated into Spanish with verbs. Some examples of commonly mistranslated prepositions in Spanish-influenced English are as follows. En in Spanish translates to both in and on in English, so ESL students might say put the food in the plate or put the soup on the bowl instead of put the food on the plate and put the soup in the bowl. Pensar en or pensar de translates as to think about, which ESL students might say as I think on him every day instead of I think about him every day. Enojarse con or enojarse de should translate to get mad at, but might be said as I got mad with him or I got mad of him instead of I got mad at him. Decidir de in Spanish translates as to decide on, but might be mistranslated into did you decide of what you want instead of did you decide on what you want. Casarse con should be translated as to marry or be married to, but often gets said as is he married with her instead of is he married to her. Enamorarse de should translate as to be in love with, but might be said as is he in love of her instead of is he in love with her. Consistir en should translate to to consist of, but an ESL student might say, what does your plan consist in, instead of what does your plan consist of. Buscar in Spanish includes the preposition in the word itself, and it means to look for. So a bilingual student might omit a preposition with the English equivalent verb and say, I look my toy, instead of I look for my toy. Subir also includes a preposition in the word, and it means to go up or to get on, so can get tr mistranslated as I go the stairs instead of I go up the stairs. Multipurpose verbs also present problematic semantics for English language learners. Verbs such as do, make, put, and take are highly subjective to transfer of meaning. This can be seen when using the English multipurpose verb to put in different contexts. For example, one can put a book on a shelf, put their clothes on, be put out with someone, or put up money for a cause, among other uses. The phrases here contain examples of multipurpose verbs that are commonly misused by children learning English. 
A child might ask, did you take a decision, rather than did you make a decision, because in Spanish, the verb used for make and make a decision is tomar, which has one common translation in English, which is to take. So the child might directly translate this verb instead of using the multi-purpose verb make, which English speakers use for purposes like making a decision, making a pie, making a fool of oneself, and more. An English language learner also might ask, do you want to put an appointment, rather than do you want to make an appointment? Because in Spanish, the verb used for make and make an appointment is poner, which has one common translation in English, which is to put. So the ELL might directly translate this verb instead of using the multi-purpose verb make, which again, English speakers use for various purposes. Another mistake children might make with multi-purpose multi verbs is translating the Spanish verb tener to the English verb to have instead of the correct English equivalent of to be. As in, the child might ask, do you have hunger, rather than are you hungry, or they might say, I have six years, rather than I am six years old, because they are directly translating the way in which they would use the verb tened in Spanish and the way in which they would phrase this question and statement in Spanish. Grammar and syntax also present problems for Spanish speakers who are in the process of learning English because there are a number of syntactic operations that differ in English and Spanish, all of which are subject to forward transfer, or the application of knowledge from one's native language and the acquisition of their second language. In other words, they are likely to follow the rules of syntax and grammar using cues from Spanish and translate them into English, rather than using the actual syntactic cues from English. This misuse of grammatical and syntac syntactical rules typically occurs until the individual gains enough English exposure or instruction to learn the cues in English. Here's a list of prominent syntactic operations that differ in English and Spanish, including word order, the placement of modifiers, the use of auxiliary verbs and questions, the use of pronouns, negation, and plurality. This is not an exhaustive list of the syntactic differences between the two languages, but it is certainly a good place to start. To begin, because word order in Spanish is very flexible, while in English it is relatively rigid and the prevailing word order is subject-verb-object, a Spanish speaker learning English might transfer the flexible word order of Spanish to English to produce me hit Zach or Zach me hit for the statement Zach hit me. Moving on to the use of modifiers, in English, the adjective precedes the noun, while in Spanish, more often than not, the noun precedes the adjective, meaning a Spanish speaker learning English would be very likely to say, she is a girl very nice, instead of she is a very nice girl. In regard to the use of auxiliary verbs and questions, English uses auxiliary verbs like am, is, are, do, does, and did, but Spanish does not. This means that a Spanish speaker learning English would be like, would be likely to ask where you went instead of where did you go, and why you no share instead of why didn't you share. Another syntactic difference between English and Spanish is in the use of pronouns. In English, pronouns are required after the subject is introduced, while in Spanish, pronouns are commonly dropped. The pair of sentences, Sally went to the store, she bought bread, would be translated to Spanish as Sally fue a la tienda, compró pan. So a child who transfers Spanish cues to English might drop the pronoun in the second sentence that refers to Sally and say, Sally went to the store, bought bread, which is the literal translation. The production of negatives also differs in Spanish and English. In English, single negatives are used, while in Spanish, double negatives are common. For example, a proficient English speaker might say, I do not want anything, while the Spanish translation would be, no quiero nada, which literally means, no I want nothing. So, it is not uncommon to hear Spanish-speaking children learning English use double negatives in English such as, I no want nothing, or I don't want nothing. Another example of a syntactic difference between Spanish and English is the marking of plurals, which are marked only once in English, but are double marked in Spanish. In Spanish, the big trees would be los árboles grandes, which translates literally to the trees bigs. Forward Q transfer might result in double plural marking in English for those who have not learned the single, mar single plural marking Q of English. So, a Spanish speaker learning English might produce the sentence, look at the big trees, as look at the trees bigs, which also contains a modifier error, or as look at the bigs trees. Next, within our five main areas of language that are affected by typical second language errors made by Spanish influent speakers comes vocabulary and semantics. One of the most obvious types of forward cue transfer in the realm of semantics is the substitution of Spanish words for English words. This is referred to as code switching, or as some may call it, Spanglish. Another type of semantic translation mistake that a Spanish speaker learning English may make is due to pairs of words across English and Spanish being false cognates, sometimes called false friends, which are words that share form but not meaning. This means that they look the same and sound the same, but don't mean the same thing. 
For example, the English word exit and the Spanish word éxito both look and sound similar. However, éxito doesn't mean exit in Spanish, it means success. An example of code switching may be when an English language learner says, I want a libro, libro meaning book, when they don't know the vocabulary word for book. Code switching is a normal process in the acquisition of a second language and is used by adults and children alike. However, normal adult bilinguals often code switch in order to add emphasis to what they are saying and generally only code switch when they know their audience will understand it. Children learning English as a second language, on the other hand, may code switch when it is the only way they know to express an idea. In regard to false cognates being the reason for semantic mistakes on behalf of Spanish speakers learning English, here is some further explanation. To understand false cognates, it is first necessary to understand what true cognates are. Cognates are word pairs within the same language or from different languages that share form and meaning. This means that the words look and sound the same or similar, and they share the same meaning. Some examples of cognates across English and Spanish are the English word train and the Spanish word tren, which differ in spelling by only a few letters. The English word hospital and the Spanish word hospital, which only differ in pronunciation. And the English word accident and the Spanish word accidente, which differ in spelling only by the addition of an E on the end of the Spanish word. False cognates, on the other hand, are word pairs that share form but not meaning. Some examples of false cognates across English and Spanish include the English word carpet and the Spanish word carpeta, meaning folder, not carpet. The English word preoccupied and the Spanish word preocupado, meaning worried, not preoccupied. And finally, one that can get you in trouble, the English word embarrassed and the Spanish word embarazada, which means pregnant, not embarrassed. Cognates are found to facilitate word processing performance for Spanish-influenced English speakers, while false cognates are found to inhibit word processing performance in Spanish-influenced English. Due to the different contexts in which bilingual children learn each language, they typically learn different words in each language. For example, a typical scenario for bilingual children involves the child's family speaking primarily Spanish in the home and the child's teacher and classmates speaking primarily English in the classroom. This may result in the child learning and knowing more vocabulary based on food items and daily routine in Spanish than in English, and learning and knowing more vocabulary based on academic concepts and school-related words such as recess in English than in Spanish. In fact, research on bilingual children's expressive vocabulary shows an approximate overlap of only 30% of words with the same meaning. This small overlap demonstrates that early school-age bilinguals have very different vocabularies in each language and highlights the importance of assessing children's complete repertoire of vocabulary in both languages. The last area of language I'll address that is affected in the speech of Spanish-influenced English speakers is phonology. Because each language has its own unique phonemic system, there are bound to be various phonemic differences between different languages, and we know that it is common for the phonemic system of a speaker's first language to influence the production of sounds in their second language, hence the term Spanish-influenced English. A few of the major differences that exist between the phonemic systems of English and Spanish are that there are quite a few consonant and vowel phonemes that occur in English but not in Spanish. For example, the ing, v, thorn, theta, z, esh, yog, h, the affricate j, and r are all consonants that are used in English but not in Spanish. Furthermore, standard American English has 14 vowel sounds, whereas Spanish has only five, a, e, i, o, and u. So the small capital I, epsilon, ash, epsilon, schwa, turned v wedge, open o, right hook schwa, and right hook reversed epsilon are all vowel sounds used in English but not in Spanish. Speech sound production is affected in Spanish-influenced English for three main reasons, or in other words, there are three ways in which the features of Spanish influence the production of consonants and vowels in English. First, the absence of phonemes or allophones in Spanish that are used in English can influence speech sound production of Spanish speakers learning English. For example, Spanish speakers may produce the word shopping as chopping because the esh phoneme does not exist alone in Spanish. Next, differences in phonotactic constraints between English and Spanish can influence the speech sound production of Spanish speakers learning English. Phonotactic constraints refer to what sound sequences are possible and what other sound sequences are not possible in a given language. For example, a phonotactic constraint in English would be that the consonant sound ing cannot occur at the beginning of words. An example of a phonotactic constraint in Spanish is that clusters in the word initial position cannot begin with s. So in English, it is very common to hear English language learners add an eh sound before the s, making star, for example, estar. 
Finally, differences in the place of articulation for consonants in English and in Spanish can influence the speech sound production of Spanish speakers learning English. For example, in English, the D phoneme is produced with the tongue tip making contact with the alveolar ridge, while in Spanish, the D phoneme is produced with the tongue tip making contact with the back of the upper central incisors. This would create a subtle difference in the production of the D phoneme for a Spanish-influenced English speaker, as they would produce the word dog, for example, dog. To conclude this presentation, I would like to take a look at this chart which lists many sound substitutions frequently made by Spanish-influenced English speakers. As mentioned previously, a Spanish speaker learning English may produce shopping as chopping, replacing the esh with the affricate ch because esh doesn't exist in Spanish. One might produce zu as su, replacing the z with s because z doesn't exist in Spanish. Think as tink, replacing theta with t because theta doesn't exist in Spanish. Then as den, replacing thorn with d because the thorn doesn't exist in Spanish. Vase as base, replacing the V with B because V doesn't exist in Spanish. Sing as sin, replacing ing with n because the ing doesn't exist in Spanish. Symptom with sinton because there exists a phonotactic constraint on the consonant cluster MPT because as Spanish developed, the consonant cluster MPT was simplified to the cluster NT only. Live as leave, replacing the small uppercase I phoneme I with the lowercase i phoneme e because the small uppercase i doesn't exist in Spanish. Sat would be pronounced with the script a instead of the ash because ash doesn't exist in Spanish. And finally, book might be pronounced as book, replacing the upsilon with the u because upsilon doesn't exist in Spanish.